So good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is David Schilling from the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility and the Investor Alliance for Human Rights. We welcome you to this webinar focusing on one of the most egregious human rights violations which is found in global supply chains in every sector, including the ICT sector. Our world has been turned upside down by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected all of us. But think for a moment of those workers in forced labor situations who have lost their jobs. And if they are foreign migrant workers, they are caught in a struggle for survival far from home, unable to practice social distancing because of cramped living conditions. So it is criti critically important that the 2020 benchmark findings report has just been released with a wealth of information that enables investors and companies alike to implement their responsibility to respect human rights as outlined by the UN Guiding Principles on Business Human Rights and the Human Rights Due Diligence Process. A little background, ICCR started its No Fees Initiative in 2014, engaging dozens of companies in a number of sectors, including the ICT sector, to adopt policies on responsible recruitment. No worker paid fees, that's the employer's responsibility, no confiscation of passports, personal papers, and written contracts at the point of recruitment. When Know the Chain published its first reports in 2016, covering seven really important themes, including recruitment, worker voice, purchasing practices and remedy, we were able to integrate the findings and additional information into our members' corporate engagements. Since then, the ICCR and the Alliance have partnered with Know the Chain on an initiative that has involved about 60 investors from the US and Europe to engage companies in the apparel footwear sector on forced labor. We know that all stakeholders, including governments, need to be involved to make progress on reducing and eliminating forced labor. So today we are fortunate to have three excellent speakers. Next slide, please. To discuss their perspectives on where we are, where we need to go. And we'll start with Felicitas Weber of Know the Chain and the Business Human Rights Resource Center. Uh, Anna Dixon will start next. Uh, she has been the human rights supply chain responsibility and accessibility uh, staff person at HP. And this is one of the highest ranked companies in the current, uh, current benchmark. And Adam Kanzer, uh, VNP Paribas Asset Management. So just a point of information, we will be holding questions until all the three speakers have given their presentations throughout the webinar. If you have a question, <clears throat> you could place it in the question box on the right side of your screen. And then during the Q&A session, you, know, you may also raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, so we're very, very happy to have these three uh, excellent speakers with us. And Felicitas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for the kind introduction and for having us, um, all, all three of us today. Um, so first of all, just to start, um, what is Know the Chain? So Know the Chain is a resource for both companies, but also for investors. Um, and we really focus on supporting companies and investors to understand and address forced labor risks within their supply chains. So um, we very much focus on supply chains rather than own operations, given there's a heightened risks in supply chains. And we also focus on high risk sectors. So one of them is the ICT sector that we'll be talking uh, about today. And just to let you know as well, we are very much focusing on um, hardware um, companies, so companies that have hardware in their supply chain, so looking at manufacturing rather than software companies. Um, we also look at food and beverage companies and apparel and footwear companies. And in each of those three sectors, we have done um, benchmarks of the largest global companies since 2016. We've done a second round in 2018 and have now um, out our, first, our third benchmark in the ICT sector. 
Um, we also have done a couple of investor briefings on the forestry and construction sectors, but the three sectors you see here listed on this slide are really the ones where we're doing the most substantial work on. Um, and obviously such work typically is done in collaboration with others. So you'll see on the slide as well, the four partners that are involved. Myself, I'm with the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, um, and we're working very closely with Humanity United, um, Verite and Sustainalytics on this. Um, so if we turn to the next slide. So first of all, maybe just briefly to start us off, like what do forced labor risks in the ICT sector look like? Um, I think one thing to consider is interesting for us that we've now that we've done that since 2016 as well, maybe how has the landscape been changing, right? Um, and what's been quite interesting for us is that in the last benchmark in 2018, we had um, you know, very concrete allegations that met our high threshold of several ILO indicators of forced labor um, um, alignment with the corporate human rights benchmark, a clear link to the company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we had that regarding three companies, right? And this year we had that allegations regarding 14 companies. So quite a big um, jump here. We've also seen um, earlier this year a study that we haven't even included because it was after the research period, but um, you know that linked a quarter of the benchmark companies to sourcing from factories um, in China and um, um, I think a lot of what David has alluded to as well, I think a study last year, um, you know, regarding a number of ICT companies focused on um, workers in Malaysia that reported um, having had to pay several months their wages um, in recruitment fees or related fees, um, really putting them in, in, in that bondage. Um, and I think the interesting thing as well, I'm just thinking about what's been changing is that these allegations don't necessarily anymore only affect the sort of more obvious targets, maybe those companies that do disclose supplier lists, but actually I think the investigators are getting more creative. We've, you know, we've seen investigations that looked at copies of contracts in the ICT sector, in the apparel sector, we've seen organizations looking at labels of clothing and use of expert data. In the food sector, we've seen trade records. So it certainly, you know, hits both companies that are more transparent about where they're sourcing from, but also those that aren't. Um, and for us, it's been really interesting as well because we have seen more allegations regarding lower tiers of supply chains. Um, so not only just those regarding direct suppliers, but also indirect suppliers. And I think these have been very interesting conversations for us as well with companies to what extent is that their responsibility. Um, we've also heard from a number of companies that their suppliers actually don't tell them um, if you know the supplier where the allegation happened is in their own supply chain or not. So they couldn't necessarily even verify that, which is a whole other challenge. So that may be just to put, um, give you a little bit context on the forced labor risks that we've been seeing. Um, and just to say as well, though I've, I've highlighted here um, China and Malaysia, but obviously, you know, we've really seen risks in, in any sourcing countries where, um, you know, there are a lot of populations in vulnerable conditions like migrant workers, like student workers, like women workers. Um, we've certainly also seen allegations in countries like um, um, Taiwan, um, Thailand, etc. And with that, if we move to the next slide. So David alluded to this already, but just to say, obviously, the current crisis really puts workers into a heightened situation of risk. Um, so we've seen information, we've seen a lot less information on the ICT sector. And I think, you know, overall, the situation it does seem a bit less severe than in the apparel sector. But we have seen a number of reports looking at China, India, Malaysia, Mexico and Vietnam. Um, and looking at working conditions of electronics workers there and you know reported labor conditions include things like obviously loss of wages restriction of movements you know being asked to return to work even though um, it's not safe sometimes that's coupled with um, monetary incentives or actually also threats of not being paid um, you know all of these are very much indicators of forced labor and i think just thinking around it from a worker perspective, just looking at that quote there, for example, if, you know, a worker that's, you know, the whole intention of going to another country is to be able to send food to their family if they then have to, or to move out of their hometown, if they then have to um, return and actually 
ask their family to send them money and rice and food, I think this is um, just puts it into perspective. Um, if we move to the next slide. Now, before we go into the benchmark results, one thing I just wanted to clarify is that um, a high score does not mean that a company has a slavery-free supply chain. I'm very much opposed to this term of slavery-free supply chains. Um, we very much operate under the assumption that um, forced labor exists in in most, if not all, global supply chains. And what it means to have a higher score is that these companies really take an effort to address and prevent those risks. Um, I also just wanted to quickly let you know that what we are looking at um, to get to our assessment is that we're looking at company disclosure in English language. We're also looking at third party information with regards to allegations um, of uh, abuse. Um, and we are also always on the lookout of how can we make it you know, easier for companies and less burdensome for companies. Um, so we are giving some credit as well for participation in multi-stakeholder initiatives or industry associations that have clear membership requirements. Um, and ideally that report on performance of members. Mm -hmm. I think that's always our dream scenario, but in the ICT sector concretely, I think the leadership group for responsible recruitment is one that has uh, clear membership requirements. Um, the Responsible Business Alliance has um, some membership levels for which we give credit. So if a company discloses that and RBA then to us confirms that, um, there is some automatic cre credit given here. Um, and you'll see at the bottom as well, so we measure engagement levels the same way as the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark does. Um, and we've had this year um, half of the companies engaged with us during a three month period where they were invited to provide more information to review our findings, to maybe point us to anything we might have missed. Um, another quarter of companies engaged with us outside that period um, in calls, in emails, um, and about a quarter of the companies didn't engage. And with that, if we go to the next slide. So these are the results um, for this year. We um, assessed the 49 largest global companies um, and the average score is 30 out of 100. I think you'll see um, quite a few companies sort of hovering around this 30 line. Um, more than three quarters of the company score less than 50%. So you'll see when you look at sort of where the 50% line is, you know, there's not all that many further up there. Um, you'll also see at the top a cluster of five companies that are really very, very closely close in their score. There's really marginal differences here. And I think equally though, you know, you see the highest score is 70. So, so there is um, room to the top. Um, I think likewise, what's also interesting, the lowest scores, um, so the lowest scoring companies is um, Xiaomi from, from China. But if you look at you know, the lowest scoring companies, these are certainly from across regions. Um, so Broadcom from the US, for example, scores a 10 out of 100. Um, European companies like Infineon and Hexagon score below 10 out of 100. Um, and another thing that was um, positive for us to see, we, we also just assessed how these findings correlate with the corporate human rights benchmark. Um, and we um, found that there was a really strong correlation of 0 0.89. So if a company has a higher score on CHAB, they also have a higher score on Know the Chain and vice versa. Um, the scores tend to be a little higher on Know the Chain, and we do think that is due to reporting legislation, um, such as the UK Modern Slavery Act, for example, that is actually applicable to uh, 47 out of these 49 companies, and many have to report under the California legislation as well. Now, if we go to the next slide. Um, so you'll see here, David mentioned already, we have these um, seven themes that we're looking at. Um, these are based on the guiding principles. They cover um, policy commitments, the next five themes broadly cover due diligence, and then there's a theme focused on remedy. Um, each year we are strengthening the methodology. So we are in particularly strengthening the worker voice and recruitment themes as good practice emerge in these um, areas. We have a stronger focus on enabling rights and freedom of association. 
not least in order to align with other um, other benchmarks like the corporate human rights benchmark, for example. So requiring this year adherence to all four ILO core labor standards for full points on a number of indicators. Um, and let me just check, David, how much more time do I have? Do I have... Um, just wondering uh, if I should speed up through some of the findings a little bit. Maybe speed up a little bit. Uh, okay. You've been speaking about, you know, nine, almost 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. So yeah. maybe, I think you get, um, I think you'll, just looking at this though, you'll see that, you know, commitment governance is the highest when it comes to due diligence implementation and also remedy the scores go down. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Um, one of the things I think we've persistently found is just that there is a massive gap in implementation. Um, so looking at themes like purchasing practices, for example, you'll see that a number of companies have, you know, the employer pays principle in place, which says that workers shouldn't have to pay um, for their job. It's it's the, you know, it's the responsibility of the employer to do so. But um, very, you know, we haven't seen any company that's integrated this principle into their purchasing practices. Um, Similarly, we've seen on grievance mechanism that most companies require their suppliers to have such a mechanism in place. But when it comes to, you know, give, when we ask companies to give us any evidence that any of these mechanisms have ever been used by workers, you know, there's very few companies who can who can provide an answer. And if we go to maybe just to the next slide already. Um, so these are the regional scores. Um, just wanted to point out again, um, you can see that companies across regions are scoring low. So there are low scores across companies across regions. What has been particularly surprising for us this year is that um, companies from Europe score lower that, on average than companies from North America and also the highest score of the European companies isn't particularly high compared to companies in the other two regions, which um, is quite different to what we're typically finding across across the three sectors we're looking at. And if we move to the next slide, so maybe really just trying to spend the last few minutes on what has actually changed since 2018. Um, what are the improvements, what we've seen, what's the most exciting things we've seen and what, um, where are there still areas for improvement? Um, so we, as I said, have strengthened the methodology. Um, if we just, if we hadn't done this, um, we could actually see some improvements across all the different themes and the average score would have improved to 32 out of 100 to 36 out of 100. Um, because we've added more companies and because we did strengthen the methodology, um, we didn't see improvements on all themes, but we've still um, seen good, good improvements on the theme of recruitment, for example. Um, you'll see here both, you know, more companies adopting an OFI policy that's really, really becoming the norm now. Um, and even though the overall numbers are still low, I think it is exciting that, you know, the number of companies that provided evidence that fees are repaid to workers has has doubled over that period. Um, what's, um, I think just to say what's particularly, the most exciting things I have seen this year is companies um, providing data on purchasing practices, for example, something we've really not seen before. So um, Corning, for example, talks about um, payment terms, talks about length of contracts, talks about percentage of orders that are changed after they're being placed. We've seen for the first time um, remedy to workers in lower tiers of the supply chain in the second tier, Intel even working on the third tier. Um, we have seen for the first time one of our remedy indicators partially met, um, that the remediation was at least partially satisfactory to the victims, um, which was a report um, from Electronics Watch where workers had reported satisfaction with the remedy provided to uh, the Migrant Workers' Rights Network, which is really exciting. And we've also seen a lot of, a lot more detail and a lot more concrete examples of what workers have done, what companies have done on recruitment fees. Um, so looking into much more details on how are fees calculated, um, on reimbursing not only recruitment fees, but also related costs, on mapping recruitment corridors. 
Um, so I think these were all hugely exciting. Um, on the flip side, um, we have, um, I think we still, all the companies still score zero on freedom for association, which um, we feel is really hugely disappointing. And overall, Worker Voice is the lowest scoring theme. Um, purchasing practice is the second lowest scoring theme. And I think there is this gap um, between policy and implementation that I mentioned before. So these are really areas where we would um, hope to see much more improvement in the future. Um, I'll leave it for here at the moment and we can go back um, later if we have time. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Felicitas. Uh, that was really helpful to get uh, in front of us some of the, the key findings and the way in which uh, you have uh, developed, you know, our strength in the approach, which is very, very important. Uh, so now we're, we're going to turn to the uh, perspective of a company that has been involved in this issue for a long time, way before the Know the Chain uh, started ranking companies. Uh, you know, the seminal point was in 2008. Um, ICCR has been engaging directly with AP for, for probably 15 to 20 years. Uh, and now we've been working with HP in the leadership group for responsible recruitment, as well as the steering committee of the Responsible Labor Initiative. So, Annika, it's really great to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so thank you, David and ICCR, for the opportunity to talk about HP's uh, uh, human rights and supply chain responsibility program this morning. Um, I wanted to start uh, with just acknowledging that we are certainly uh, living extraordinary times right now. And I'm very glad that we're having this conversation on how to drive ethical business practices in global supply chain today. I also wanted to uh, recognize Know to Chain for establishing a reputable tool for companies and investors to understand these issues and make some informed decisions about how to drive issues forward. Uh, certainly for us at HP, we know uh, we use know to chain to better understand our relative performance against our competitors and also how to assess uh, where we can where we are doing well and where we can improve. So let's go to the next slide. So um, let me start by saying that at HP, we pride ourselves of being a company of high integrity, uh, transparency and trust. And this slide uh, shows you HP's human rights journey. And as you can see, the journey began nearly 20 years ago, like David mentioned, um, with the recognition that we needed to put in place a supplier code of conduct to address the risk faced by our supplier workers and start to conduct due diligence in our supply chain. And, from there, we work together with our industry peer companies, uh, our competitors of ours, to establish a common code for the electronics industry. And this then led into HP becoming a co-founder of the Responsible Business Alliance, formerly known as Electronics Industry Citizenship Coalition, that is today world's largest industry coalition dedicated to corporate social of responsibility in global supply chains. And related to the forced labor issue, in 2014, uh, we were the first IT company to establish a migrant worker standard that required uh, um, direct employment of migrant workers, among other things, from our suppliers. And at the same time, we also adapted our sustainable impact and human rights policy to include commitment to due diligence, worker voice, and investigation and remedy. And uh, um, I'm happy to say that we are just about to publish our human rights progress report, uh, the first one um, ever. And it is a standalone publication about uh, human rights. Uh, how do we manage this program and what our progress has been over time? So in terms of the human rights due diligence, we align our practices to the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and the UN Global Compact. And our due diligence process is risk-based and is guided by severity of the potential adverse impact on human rights. And really it focuses on three key aspects. Um, first of all, embedding responsible business conduct into all of the uh, business practices that we have. Secondly, seizing, preventing and remedying uh, the impact. And then finally, reporting and implementing on the results. So um, in addition to this, we conduct annual human rights risk assessment, which includes identification of salient risks across the entire company, um, not just our supply chain, but 
all of our clothing functions. And in this last year, uh, we invested more resources in expanding our due diligence to our own operation, including our own offices, as well as our own manufacturing and our indirect supply chain. So indirect supply chain for us is anything that doesn't go into making our products, uh, but rather supports our, our um, business practices and business operations. So think about things like logistics and recycling. We have covered those in our human rights risk assessment as well uh, this past year. And in the same time frame, we also continue to expand our production supplier due diligence to smaller and sub-tier suppliers. So next slide, please. Let's just talk about uh, supply chain responsibility program. So specific to supply chain, this uh, uh, slide uh, shows you the program approach. Uh, the first and foremost, the most fundamental step is the business integration. And we have embedded the human rights expectations, uh, including freely chosen employment and collective bargaining, et cetera, into our supplier contracts and agreements. And we've also implemented the supplier scorecard that is part of the business award program that measures social and, and environmental responsibility um, performance of the supplier and is included in the business negotiations. Uh, the next step in the process is supply chain risk and supplier performance management. And we assess risk based on a couple of factors, including level of spend that we have with the supplier, the supplier's geographic location, uh, the manufacturing that they do for us on the site, and other um, external reputational or business information. And based on these factors, then we prioritize suppliers for assessments, which might include self-assessment as well as on-site audits. And following those assessments, we work with the suppliers to implement corrective actions in the areas where it, where it is needed. And we work very closely with the suppliers to also provide um, proactive capability building program. And in the space of forced labor, we've been doing many foreign migrant worker trainings and education with our suppliers. Our approach today covers about 95% of our spend um, and includes final assembly and commodity suppliers. And those commodity suppliers are sometimes referred to as sub tier suppliers. And uh, um, on the top of this pyramid is the partnerships. Uh, so we work very closely in partnership with our suppliers and industry peers and Responsible Business Alliance as our main industry association in this space. And uh, um, these partnerships are really fundamental for this work um, in combating forced labor. We simply cannot solve these complex issues alone. And as many of you know, um, electronics industry supply chains are very global. The workforces are highly mobile between industries and geographies, and multiple companies often even source from the uh, same supplier base. So we fully recognize that to make progress at the scale that is needed to shift the needle in human rights issues, we need to work with others inside and outside of our industry. And that is why we've helped to establish and remain active in some of the industry coalitions like the Leadership Group for Responsible Recruitment and the Responsible Labor Initiative. So a um, couple of words about the Responsible Labor Initiative that has been uh, closest to my heart for sure, having chaired the steering committee until November last year. Um, the Responsible Labor Initiative uh, was first launched in 2017. And uh, what they have focused on so far is uh, uh, to drive expansion of forced labor due diligence uh, um, across multiple sectors, not just electronics. And one of the main due diligence tools that they have developed is an audit specific to forced labor issues. And uh, once this tool was released and introduced, uh, um, it was uh, very popular. In fact, it uh, immediately resulted into 91% of increase in schedule audits. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, when you do more audits, you have more findings. And so uh, what we found was that the findings went up about 47%. Um, and why is this important? It is important because doing this due diligence work is fundamental and it will catalyze the companies uh, to remediate those conditions in their supply chain. And uh, um, so far to date, um, the Responsible Business Alliance and Responsible Labor Initiative uh, uh, members have uh, remediated uh, uh, in excess of 35 million US dollars of repayments back to the workers. 
Next slide, please. And we so, have about two minutes, two minutes left, yes. if that's okay. Wrapping up, wrapping oh, up. Thank you. <laughs> So there is a tremendous power in collective approach uh, uh, to understand forced labor issues in our shared supply chains and to implement corrective actions uh, and jointly and, and remedy the workers. And, and uh, um, while fixing issues is important, um, the ultimate goal is to get to prevention. And uh, um, HP is now working with SHIFT. Uh, SHIFT is a nonprofit specialized uh, in human rights integration to business practices. Um, so we're working with SHIFT and RBA uh, to develop some indicators for forced labor. Um, and with these indicators, we hope to be able to predict uh, where and how forced labor may happen in global supply chains. And in doing so, also gain higher confidence that the expectations that we're setting for our supply chain will be met. The other partnership that I wanted to mention is that uh, um, um, we are um, working with the uh, ISARA Institute. Um, they are an independent NGO focused on forced labor prevention, and we've engaged them in a pilot uh, uh, program in one of our factories in Southeast Asia. And what they will provide to us is an enhanced worker voice mechanism, and uh, um, they will also assist us in uh, ethical recruitment in migrant worker um, uh, issues in the sending countries. And by this, we hope to be moving more from audit-based monitoring to actually worker-driven monitoring. Mm -hmm. And so just to uh, wrap up my remarks, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, human rights and supply chain responsibility is definitely a material issue for us. There is increasing number of customer questions. Last year alone, we had about $3.7 billion worth of new or existing business uh, associated to supply chain responsibility alone. Uh, these issues are becoming compliance requirements for companies like ours and investors like all of you. And uh, uh, given the increasing expectations, we're very proud to uh, have been uh, have been rated among the two companies uh, consistently, top two companies consistently by uh, knowledge chain since their rating started, even if the bar continues to rise. Um, and uh, um, in addition to that, we were ranked one of the top three ICT companies uh, among 40 by the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark. So um, with that, um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to to talk about these issues this morning and uh, happy to take questions later. Uh, Anika, thanks so much. I uh, appreciated that uh, comprehensive and, and, and relatively short, right? <laughs> I wish we had more time. So now we're going to get another perspective here from uh, the investor, uh, uh, the investor community. Uh, Adam Kanzer has been, uh, actually we've worked together for more than uh, two decades. Uh, first at Domini and now at uh, BNP Paribas Asset Management. So Adam, you have really been closely uh, not only following Know the Chain, but also using it as a tool. So could you give some of your perspective uh, uh, as the investor uh, in seven or eight minutes? Thanks. Yeah, sure, David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Terrific. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, as David said, uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm head of stewardship for the Americas at uh, BNP Paribas Asset Management. Uh, we are the asset management arm of BNP Paribas, the French bank, uh, with roughly 450 billion uh, in U.S. dollars under management. Um, and we've had commitment to sustainable investing uh, since 2002. Um, I want to talk so a little bit about um, I think what this issue of forced labor represents um, to investors, why we should be why we should be concerned about it and, and actively working on it, um, and a little bit about uh, what our expectations are of companies, and, and, and of course also the the importance of the Know the Chain benchmark in all of this. Um, so first, so we launched a global sustainability strategy last year, uh, and um, we defined equality and inclusive growth as one of the necessary preconditions for a sustainable economy. Uh, now, you can't have equality and inclusive growth in a system where forced labor is pervasive. In, investors are, are very good, I think, at distinguishing between companies, uh, benchmarking companies, which company does better than another. Um, not quite as good uh, with persistent systemic problems. 
And unfortunately, forced labor is one of those, one of those issues. Um, we need to recognize that forced labor represents a market failure. Setting aside the impact to any individual company stock price, this should be a core reason for investors to engage. Um, unfortunately, financial materiality commands too much investor attention, and it causes us to miss the forest for the trees. Sometimes it allows us to miss the biggest risks. So a migrant worker may be working for no pay, without consent, but very far down a company's supply chain. So it's unlikely to hit stock price. So it is therefore immaterial, meaning it's not important. This mentality rewards those that are best at hiding their worst problems. We need to recognize that the system we rely on to build value for our clients is broken. We all, and we, of course, we all struggle to address um, systemic issues. Where, we, where do they fit in our models? Uh, we can make lots of great arguments about uh, quality of management. Um, there's lots of good arguments to be made, and there's a report that accompanied the Know the Chain benchmark, which I encourage people to read. It does a really good job kind of laying out those risks. Um, but I think you know, what is underappreciated by investors is that when you, when there's a sizable base of abused workers around the world, uh, year in and year out, this will have impacts to economies and will ripple out in unpredictable ways. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and there's a, there is actually a benefit, there's actually a silver lining here, which is that all the weaknesses in our systems have been laid bare. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to address those weaknesses. And if you look at the elements of the Know the Chain benchmark, elements like full traceability of a supply chain, worker voice and representation, uh, uh, policies to protect worker health and safety. These are all key elements of resilience. Uh, resilience for supply chains, resilience for economies, resilience for companies long-term. Uh, these are the things that companies need to be doing for the long-term. Um, so in the, we talked a little bit about uh, the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights which establishes obligations upon companies. It also establishes obligations for investors. Uh, we're, we're in the midst of a very interesting conversation at the Investor Alliance for Human Rights about um, what, effective hum, what, what does effective human rights due diligence look like for a broadly diversified investor? It's, it's, it's quite difficult when you're invested in thousands of companies uh, across all markets uh, to really be able to say that you've done effective human rights due diligence. So benchmarks like Know the Chain really help us to rationalize this process and identify priorities. It, anyone looking at it quickly is going to know this, it doesn't cover the entire investable universe. It doesn't come close to covering the entire investable universe. But, that, but it does give us a place to start. It does provide us with the right elements that we can take to other companies that are not listed on the benchmark. So it's it's not an excuse. so the fact that it's under inclusive is not an excuse not to not to work with it and get started. Um, now, in, in terms of when we speak to companies about these issues, look, the bare minimum for any business before you tell me anything about your business, you should be able to say that the workers that contribute to the production of your products are paid based on local law and consent to do the job that they that they're performing. And unfortunately, uh, companies are failing to meet that baseline standard. And yet, there's not a single CEO in the world that will stand up and defend forced labor. Every company in the world recognizes that this, this needs to be abolished. An average score of 30 out of 100 is absolutely unacceptable. And investors really need to be making that clear. Uh, we're seeing inadequate policies with little evidence that there's much in the way of implementation. Now, it's also true, uh, Know the Chain bases their information largely on publicly available information. When you start to talk to companies, sometimes you'll find that they actually do have a lot to say and they do understand the issues, but they haven't disclosed. So engagement is worth it. Uh, you'll learn, and, and you will learn a lot about the management team. We're not, I, I always say in these discussions that we're not looking for perfection. Uh, we're looking to know that the company understands the issues they're facing, that they're wrestling with it, not that they've solved it, because if they say they've solved it, that's a red flag for us. We know that no company has solved these problems. We want to know that they're wrestling with it um, and that they recognize that there's a systemic problem and that they're looking for systemic solutions, that they're working with their industry peers to try to solve that. And on the other hand, 
we should expect perfection in this area. Every company should be striving for a hunt for a for a perfect score on this benchmark. Uh, it's difficult. We don't want to. I don't want to understate how difficult it is to implement these things effectively, but that should be the goal. Um, we we shouldn't be looking for a, a average or slightly above average score. And I, I know I'm coming to the end of my time, so let me say two two quick things. One of the things that the benchmark reveals every year is that the best companies in the world are sourcing from the worst companies in the world. That's an issue that really needs to be addressed. And, and, I, and I continue to kind of scratch my head about this, that you know, the, the companies at the very top are sourcing from the companies at the very bottom. So there's, there's, there's some gaps in, 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 their, in that system there. Um, investors really need to open their eyes to these issues because I, I think one of, the, one of the core problems is, is that it's so egregious that we assume that it's not happening. But it is pervasive, it is happening everywhere. And if you don't have the resources to engage uh, and to really grapple with this, the very least you can do is vote for shareholder proposals that are addressing human rights due diligence and are, and, uh, are addressing uh, forced labor issues. Because those tools, th th those proposals are really effective tools for driving progress. I will note very quickly, uh, Friends Fiduciary had a majority vote at Microchip this past year. Um, which means that Microchip is at the table speaking to us about what to do about that. So the tool works. Vote for it, please. Uh, and I will stop there. Adam, thank you so much. Uh, and now we're going to turn to uh, a Q&A for the remainder of the time. Uh, so a couple of, there are a number of questions in the chat box, and maybe I could start with, um, you know, uh, sort of, Annika, there's a question about, you know, you're doing a lot of excellent, uh, excellent work. Uh, and they're, they're interested in hearing about kind of the worker driven monitoring. What are the challenges here? Can you also say anything about uh, purchasing practice? So uh, go ahead, Annika. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, uh, um, so the partnership that I mentioned with Isara Institute is currently a pilot. So I think we will be certainly learning from uh, uh, from this activity, and and uh, uh, provided that it is successful, we look to continue on that journey to implement it with other suppliers as well. I think a couple of a uh, um, couple of important points about uh, uh, worker driven monitoring is that I think companies like ours uh, um, will need to uh, be able to find the right partners uh, to be. Able Able to engage with. Um, there are a lot of field, org work, field work organizations, including ISARA, that are really excellent at this. And I think to strengthen our approach that has so far been um, sort of audit-based approach is really important uh, uh, to be complemented by some of those some of those partners. And uh, um, Felicitas mentioned about the uh, worker voice and the importance of worker voice. Uh, many of these organizations have uh, have good experience in uh, um, strengthening worker voice uh, um, within the companies, and and so that's also what we what we look to learn. Um, but I think the partnership and uh, um, and making sure that you have the right partners there is is very important uh, uh, in the worker. Um, worker driven driven monitoring uh, so that we have the right representation of the workers and that we can truly start to discover some of those issues um, that are um, that are present in the facilities and and uh, of work on on driving uh, the the uh, improvement forward great thank you so much and a question felicitas what are the sources of information that are are they available for in terms of remedy namely like the reimbursement of fees are these sources verifiable very good question and very important question um so we do largely look at corporate disclosure um also when it comes to remedy um it has been an incredibly effective question though to ask in the first place like what are the remedy outcomes for workers right because typically companies very much focus well we have an you know we have an audit process we have a corrective action process can tell you that you know maybe a policy has changed at the supplier but when you really dig into but what concretely has changed for the workers um there isn't very much coming anymore so i do think even in this case disclosure even coming from a company is a good indication. Um, as I briefly mentioned before, where there are concrete allegations, we also do want to see that they're satisfactory to the victims and this has to come 
would have typically have to come from a third um, source. Um, in this case, um, in the one case that we ever had in our three years of benchmarking, I'm really excited about this. Um, it did come from the Migrant Worker Rights Network um, where workers reported back. Great. Um, so a question maybe for anybody on the panel, I mean, re recruitment fees uh, uh, get a lot of attention. Is this the most salient risk in terms of forced labor? Uh, Adam, would you like to take a crack at that? <laughs> um, our home investment. Well, it is, I will say it is a salient risk. Yeah. Um, is it the most salient risk? Is that really hard? That's a really hard actually that's a very good question it's a very hard one to answer um I, I wish that we had full transparency um into all these supply chains to really honestly know um what are the worst abuses that are going on um if you're sourcing from um factories that um are producing from the xinjiang region of china um i, I would say that those abuses are worse um than than recruitment fees but but let's Take a look at recruitment fees just for a moment. Um, you know, and David, you know, you, you and I had a we had a conversation with a company. Uh, I guess it was last year, maybe a year and a half ago, where we talked about reimbursement of recruitment fees in a situation where it was pretty well documented that um, workers were not only um, not paid uh, for an extended period of time because they had to reimburse uh, the recruitment the, re the recruiters. Uh, but they were also really put in in conditions that were just really absolutely unacceptable in terms of health and safety and the company's response was well you know every time this issue comes up why are we always being asked to write a check why, why is that the solution and i don't like i don't like how that's the solution you know that's like a one-size-fits-all solution well when you get down to the core of the issue here somebody in your supply chain stole from your workers it's it's theft. It's just basically theft. The, the the best way to compensate when somebody has been robbed is to pay them back. Um, there's just that's that's baseline, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. People working without pay uh, for a long time, sometimes for a year, maybe two years. Um, so it's pretty egregious. Now, are there worse things out there? Unfortunately, yes, there are. There are worse things out there, but but this issue is pervasive. Okay. Boy, thank you so much. So you brought up uh, Xinjiang province. So Anuka, it, you know, HP was named in the ASPI report. This was an Australian report uh, about a month ago or so uh, that really named, I think, about 83 companies uh, that were uh, connected to, according to the report, on forced labor, not just in the autonomous region, but uh, elsewhere in China through the government program uh, of recruiting workers and, and getting them into uh, factories. So uh, any comment about you know, how to uh, address this uh, and how do you think about it and how do you uh, work with others in your, uh, in your sector? Yes, thank you for that. So, so as we talked about um, earlier, you know, we have very strict policies against involuntary labor um, of any kind in our supply chain and any instance of forced labor is, is uh, uh, ex unacceptable for us. And, uh, um, and in terms of this report and its finding, um, you know, none of our contracted suppliers uh, um, produce HP products in the Xinjiang region and we do not uh, knowingly source from that particular region and uh, um, and regarding the allegations in the report uh, um, we did have one um, only two of the suppliers named in the report were actually uh, connected to, uh, to HP and uh, the most recent orders with those suppliers uh, um, have not actually um, identified any forced labor issues. We continue to work with those suppliers to understand um, how to uh, try forward uh, um, continuous improvement and and uh, um, and understand the worker demographics and uh, um, and the situation on the site. Um, what I wanted to mention on this issue in particular is that uh, um, 
due to the complexity of the supply chains, um, we taking additional proactive actions to perform additional due diligence um, on the direct suppliers and uh, further investigating our indirect supplier base as well. And uh, one of the things that we have been ha have had in discussions or with the Responsible Business Alliance is really around how do we get to the bottom of the issues with maybe adjusting our tools and our due diligence processes um, to really start to understand the issues that are very complex and sensitive in nature that could be in some um, in some cases hidden. So I think we need to develop different approaches to understand that, and uh, um, and you know the um, worker driven monitoring is part of those tools that could work here as well. Thank you. Uh, so, Felicitas, uh, what is your assessment of the some of the reporting mechanisms, California legislation, UK Modern Slavery Act, uh, also moving into like uh, the French regulations that are more uh, mandatory? What's the impact, do you think, uh, on reducing forced labor trafficking? Yeah, great question. And actually, just thank you to the audience. I think all of the questions were really interesting and really um, great questions. So thank you. Um, That's why I think, we're going to go for two hours instead of yeah, one. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think why where they have been incredibly effective is in really driving awareness. Um, so you can have a conversation now, you know, in particular in the UK, but also in other countries with companies about those topics with investors and others. Um, also, the reach of some of these legislations is really impressive, right? So um, over 90% of the companies we benchmark are, even though none are actually headquartered in the UK, have to report under the UK Act and actually also the California legislation. Um, and even the companies that don't engage with us, if we do point out that they don't have a statement in place and we believe they're required to do that, that is a point of engagement for us where they then feel um, that, you know, they have to put out at least a statement and their legal person gets nervous. Um, that said, I mean, obviously under these legislations, you can say you just do nothing at all. Um, and you know, the California legislation requires you to put out one statement and that's it. Um, and they are very much lacking teeth, right? Or, I mean, what, what the concrete impacts for workers are is very doubtable. So we really, as the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, continue to push for a mandatory human rights due diligence. And I think there's a lot of movement um, in that space in Europe at the moment, and actually a lot of support from investors and companies as well. Right. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, so maybe, uh, let's see, there are a few questions for you, Anuka, let's see, the um, one, is, one, relates, one relates to the issue of mining of cobalt uh, in, the, uh, in the BRC, and uh, the WHO had put out rules related to COVID-19, and it sounds like there was a lot of uh, workers that were that continued to have to work in the kind of horrible conditions uh, and weren't able to protect themselves. Did, was a HP aware of this and were there moves on your part to sort of get a sense of what was happening in your own supply chain um, related to the, uh, the informal mining? Right. Um, so I'm not aware of that particular um, uh, report, uh, if that refers to a report that was that was put out. Uh, um, I think in in regards to the mining situation, we've seen a couple of a uh, um, couple of uh, reports come out as of late around uh, uh, conditions in in certain countries, including some of the additional um, additional conflict minerals. Uh, um, and I think this issue uh, is one of those issues that. Uh, um, that we are working together with the responsible mining initiative, as responsible sorry minerals initiative of the RBA, and uh, um, and to be able to um, understand the issues of uh, like. 10 or uh, 12 uh, steps removed from us, uh, we need to make sure that we continue to understand that uh, from the industry perspective. Um, typically, where we have the most influence and most visibility is with our direct suppliers. And so there, certainly, we have engaged with our suppliers on the COVID issues, understanding what their, um, what how the pandemic is uh, um, impacting them and what they, what they are doing to 
to uh, address these issues on their side. We've also worked with uh, um, our industry partners and, and competitors of ours to put out uh, um, supply chain communication about uh, um, about the pandemic and, and uh, engaging directly with the suppliers now that the facilities are coming back online and to support them throughout the recovery period. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question about uh, the, the ICT sector. I mean, we've, we've been talking about the basically the shutdown of uh, so much of the economy since COVID-19, and it's only been, what, three months? I mean, it's just unbelievable how the world has changed. Uh, we know from our work in the uh, apparel footwear sector that uh, they've been really, really impinged on by the shutdown and also some of the companies not paying for product that they'd already uh, contracted for and had been completed, et cetera. So there's, but even the base level of wages, let's say in Bangladesh or Cambodia or Indonesia, very, very low. So really had a hard time. Whereas the ICT sector hasn't been quite as impacted is maybe as the garment sector. So maybe start with you, Anukan, and also, you know, is the base uh, within the your sector uh, more on the living wage level rather than the kind of the, the minimum wage or below? And I'd like others to comment as well, but start with you, Anukan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. It's an interesting question and certainly a very topical for us right now. Um, we are doing a living wage studies around the world to, uh, um, on a regular basis. And right now we're going through the refreshed uh, look of that study uh, to understand where the wages are at. And what we're finding is that in our sector, the wages uh, tend to be higher. They tend to be, um, in some instances, uh, um, matching or uh, even above the living wage standards that are that are out there and we are having a um, having an active conversation with our suppliers about uh, wages obviously you know we have a requirement to uh, uh, to pay um, the legally required minimum wage and then also we want to understand with our suppliers on what are the structures of the wage and the, and the total benefits that the that the uh, workers get uh, given that those uh, vary from from uh, supplier to supplier but really what we're finding is that uh, um, that the living wage conversation is uh, is very much uh, uh, one that uh, is matching the the uh, uh, wage levels right now in most most parts of those studies and we continue to understand that better and have conversations with our suppliers great thank you uh felicitas any comments in terms of uh, the work that the, you know the chain has done and the question of living wage in different sectors I just wanted to bring it back to a lot of um, Adam um, Adam's comments. I think I think it. I would love to have a conversation about living wage, but we are so often really still having a conversation about our wages being paid at all, our over over hours being paid. Um, you know, we have seen reports, you know, from a worker, for example, last year in a report that did say he sometimes actually had to pay his employer money rather than getting money because, you know, even though maybe the recruitment fee issues then got solved, like the, lots of other fees were invented for accommodation, for a work permit, for fees for this and that. So it is still about, you know, even as um, I think Adam said, even just getting the minimum wage would be a massive achievement. And I think also, um, you know, the Responsible Business Alliance, for example, is doing a factory survey now at the moment each month and looking at impacts and sort of our factories opening, reopening and so on. And they did uh, find that 35% of factories are paying workers who have not returned to work um, uh, COVID related. So, um, you know, that means 65% of factories don't, right? So I just want to put that in perspective, but would love to advance to a living wage conversation at some point. Good. Excellent. Uh, we have maybe... Uh one minute left, but maybe a quick comment back to the uh, issue of uh, Xinjiang. Uh, you know, did HP work with other brands uh, or with the RBA when it came to looking at uh, forced labor, in particularly uh, Uyghur forced labor uh, at suppliers site level? Yes, that's exactly the uh, work that is uh, um, going on right now and the active discussions that we're having with Responsible Business Alliance, like I mentioned previously, we're wanting to um, 
have a conversation about, yes, how can we use the current due diligence tools to understand the situation better, but also really importantly, what is it that we would need to change in our uh, approach to get to the bottom of those issues? And that is definitely the conversation that we're having with the Responsible Business Alliance and, and many of our um, um, gear companies are part of that conversation given the supplies chains are shared. I think there is also an opportunity for the electronics industry and the Responsible Business Alliance to work with other industries given that many other industries including apparel um, um, may, may be sourcing from the same region and uh, may have had a, a longer history of, uh, um, of working through those issues. So I think again in that um, particular issue as with any forced labor issue um, the the um, workers are um, uh, very mobile uh, across industries and across geographies and I think what we do need there is really a cross industry collaboration to to um, be able to scale the programs to the level that they have an appropriate impact on combating force labor. Okay, great. Thanks so much. So we'll need to wrap up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, uh, thanks so much, uh, Felicitas. Anuka and Adam for your presentations. Uh, also, there's ongoing work uh, in this arena. I mentioned earlier about the apparel footwear uh, initiative that Know the Chain, um, you know, ICCR, the Alliance have been really focusing on over a year, uh, year and a half, year and a quarter. Uh, and also the with the new report, we'll be looking at some of that engagement as well in the ICT sector. So if you need more information about that, you know, you know, email me uh, at 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 the SCHILLING, it's on the board here, and or Anita Durrett, and uh, uh, and then with Felicitas as well, working with us in partnership with CBIS, uh, Julie Tanner from CBIS, we have a strong uh, commitment from about 60 companies to move forward. I uh, also want to thank Anita as well as uh, Alexis Fisher who helped put together the uh, this this webinar. Uh, this will be uh, this has been being recorded. We'll get out the link. But thank you so much uh, for participating and also for the speakers. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation. It's uh, one webinar can cover a lot, and we certainly. Uh, you know, help to lay a foundation, uh, but we'll continue to work together and to move the needle because the urgent need is there, not just because of COVID-19, but some of the structural issues. So it takes uh, investor responsibility, corporate responsibility, and working with partners on the ground, worker-driven initiatives, uh, NGOs, and government. So thanks so much for joining today. Uh, we very much appreciate your presence and uh, have a good rest of the day and stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you.